Wizards of the Coast just released the first wave of new Capenna spoilers. We've got crazy crime families and amazing lands to talk about. Magic. I am a wizard. History. I'm an old wizard. The magic historian. My bones hurt. Greetings. Owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles, my friends, I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered to talk about new Capenna goodness. Not only do we have a number of spoiler cards to talk about, but we get a bunch of background information about the world of Capenna as well. So without any further ado, let's look at some spoiler cards. Our first Capenna spoiler is pretty wild. One blue, one white, and one green gets you Broker's Ascendancy. This is an enchantment that says at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control. Right out of the gate, this feels amazing. Just knowing that each of your creatures is gonna grow is great, but then having your planeswalkers grow alongside them is fantastic. The fact that it kicks in during the end step instead of the upkeep means you're gonna benefit from it the first turn that you play it. On top of that, the concept of this card is very amusing to me from multiple angles. We're dealing with New Capenna. New Capenna is a world that was originally a city built by angels, right? And now it's a city that's been taken over by demonic mobsters. And what we're actually seeing in this card is one of the five major crime families of New Capenna. And later on in the video, we will actually go over all five families, but this is the brokers and they are essentially the lawyer group of this world, but obviously they're not good people. You can see just from the flavor text here, it says, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and more importantly, a profitable one. Now sign here. And it's interesting because the artwork shows a very disparate group of individuals and this represents green, white, and blue in the world of New Capenna. Normally, when you would think of crime-aligned organizations and things like that in Magic the Gathering, you're going to find those heavily aligned with black, red, or blue, black in most cases. So this is an interesting twist on that, showing us what these other colors do when they're operating in a world where everybody is on the take. And the artwork is very interesting with the disparate characters that are being shown in both versions of it. When you take a look at the golden age frame version, you can see essentially the same group of individuals being represented in a very different art style that really really does a good job of hearkening back to the older era days in terms of like the early 1900s, which is what New Capenna is trying to evoke. Admittedly, seeing like a panther or something like that in a fedora, or possibly that actually looks like a trilby because of the brim. But either way, the clothing is a little bit different. I haven't seen a cat in modern clothing, but this is an interesting card and a new variation of the ascendancies that we saw originally back in the dragon's block. Now this is not the only spoiler we have to talk about. We also have a glorious cycle of basics and some other stuff to talk about. The islands that we have up on the screen, I like the contrast between one being shown with the darkness and the other shown with the light. You have this crazy massive statue of an angel, right? That looks like an angel standing there with the sword with the wings shrouded around it. You've got this big beautiful building in the back that kind of makes me think of that older movie, The Shadow. I don't know if you guys have seen that. There's a there's an invisible building in that movie, and that is one of the things that stuck the most with me. But think about an, a world built by angels. This is a view of it, right? And now it's taken over by these demons, but it still does look quite resplendent. And actually take a moment to look down at the expansion symbol on the card as well. It is a set, it's a knuckle duster or brass knuckles as they're known with angel wings behind them. Although it does at the same time 
kind of look like a flying muffin. I'm just putting that out there. Next, we've got the forests. This again shows an awesome looking statue. I like the way that nature is being represented by creeping in on the city, right? This is a different way than it's illustrated in, let's say, for example, a plane that is all city, Ravnica, right? Ravnica shows it sort of as like cultured gardens here and things like that. You might have some kind of rooftop setup, whereas this is just nature kind of overtaking buildings. And this may kind of be a sign of neglect in a way, right? Now that the demons have taken over this angelic city, does that mean they're no longer taking care of it the same way and it is basically bound for ruin, right? A once beautiful city that will ultimately, ultimately fall to ruin? That's a fun concept to me. After that, we've got the plains, and this one is, it's quite different. I mean, we've got a number of trains being shown on there, the inside of a building with a chandelier. The flavor that they're doing here is quite the departure from regular magic. Admittedly, I do prefer the swords and sorcery style of magic, but I am also appreciative of the striking aesthetic of this set so far. I wasn't really sure what to expect from New Capenna. And these artwork here are very interesting to me. After that, we've got the swamps showing kind of the most rundown aspects of the city, I guess. On the left hand, you've got an overrun gigantic, what was originally a mansion, I suppose. And it looks like there are koi swimming down in the water. It could be a half peaceful kind of vibe with the fish and the lily pads, but the water does have that murky blood red kind of vibe. Who knows what's lurking down there? And it's probably unhealthy to be submerged in the water that is included in this as well, right? And then you can see in the other swamp, there's literally some kind of industrial runoff or something pouring out of a tube, almost giving you a Dr. Seuss vibe of don't pollute, right? And I mean, that makes sense for a swamp vibe. Now, the last basics we have to talk about are the mountains and the one on the left looks absolutely crazy to me it's like this is it supposed to be some kind of big steam works or something like the inside of a foundry the artwork is really striking and somewhat reminiscent of stained glass as well actually i'm not sure exactly what's going on but there's so much detail in there that it draws the eyes right in and it's an interesting contrast to the other mountain when they're on the screen together because the other mountain has more of a simplistic pulled in kind of vibe to it and it's interesting how the bottom half of the building is shown red like the mountain where the light is beaming up at the top it's showing yellow instead it's definitely interesting artwork now let us turn to a more fun style of land because the triomes are now coming back to finish off the cycle now these ones will be based around locations under the rule of the different five crime families right so this is xander's lounge essentially each land will be keyed to the leader of each of the five crime families. And this also illustrates some of the other card frames that we've got. So you can see the borderless and the skyscraper styling as well. So Xander's, Lou Xander's Lounge is a land that is an island swamp and a mountain. That's one of the things that makes Triumphs insane. They count as three different basic land types, even though they aren't basic lands, right? It enters the battlefield tabs, Taps for three manas of color, and it has cycling for three, right? This lets you discard it if you want to draw a card. So if you get it later on, then you're just like, meh, I'll pitch it and draw another card. Like, the Triomes are really good lands, man. They, they're, they're maybe the downside, yeah, they come into play tapped. But overall, they're really solid. So, flavor tag says, Maestro's agents can lie low in high style at the opulent Shadow Hostel. And you can see this is a very ritzy, swanky kind of lounge. And you'll notice that there's a symbol in the background above that red couch. It's also shown in the middle artwork as part of this gigantic plaque here with the individuals kind of slanting off to the side. Pretty cool looking, right, overall. Now that is the symbol of one of the, uh, the crime families there pretty clearly, right? So that is the... 
blue, black, red crime family, which is the Maestros. And that's actually right there in the flavor text as well, which is an easier way to try and figure out which one is which. Now, of these three artworks, I find that the Skyscraper variant is the most attractive. I really like it. It just kind of speaks of a certain level of wealth and all these interesting curios. This would be a cool place to chill, although maybe too high scale for me personally, right? Moving on. We've got Zia Tora's Proving Ground. Quite a change from the previous land we looked at, isn't it, right? So, same kind of deal as the previous land, but this one's the Swamp Mountain Forest. Flavor text says, The restless riveteers can always find a sparring partner in the sprawling Treza warehouse. So, this is the riveteers faction, and this is a gigantic, I assume, kind of cargo warehouse where they keep all their illicit goods but also have like street fighting you know what i mean not not really street fighting but they have the kind of underground boxing going on and it's a pretty straight up place to prove yourself right get in there get some knuckles going on against each other bam bam who's the biggest beefiest demon in the city and the uh, borderless card again does a great job of showing you the riveteers symbol. So I do like that because you get them included in the watermark with the cards as well. Now in terms of these three, I actually like the regular artwork better than the other two. The skyscraper artwork, I might enjoy more if it didn't have a dude cleaning it in the middle. That to me makes it less appealing overall, but whatever. Think about that solitary experience of that guy cleaning all the jank off the mat after people have been proven. Next up, Jetmere's Garden. This is the mountain forest plains. The park-like cabaretti grounds offers rest, food, and the perfect place to shake off a tail. There you go. I'm on the lamb. I'm hiding from the law. So this is obviously for the cabaretti. Now I got to say, out of the five, um, five crime families, the cabaretti are the ones that I would probably be most likely to hang with. I love the nature vibe of their place. You can see their symbol shown on the borderless version, but you can actually see it also in the background of both of the other versions. The one on the left has it hanging up off of the post there, kind of making a gateway, and you can see people lounging around with flute, uh, flutes, fruits, and big old rutabagas, and uh, what, uh, what do we got there? Uh, rhubarb. You ever had rhubarb, man? That stuff is sour. Do not eat raw rhubarb. It's terrible. Anyways, that one is my favorite of these three, and I definitely dig this particular family. Let us move on to the next family. This is Rafine's Tower. This is Plains, Islands, and Swamps. So this is the, the Obscura. The Obscura's Cloud Spire dominates the skyline. It's I, a beacon of progress that sees all. And look at the symbol for it. The symbol for it is a hand with a dagger being stabbed into it. That is pretty intense. Is it like the palm of the hand? Is it the back of the hand? Why is a knife being jammed into there? Is that sort of like, we will stop you? Does it reference some kind of pledge and it actually kind of looks like the hole that it's touching in the palm is a keyhole so it's very very interesting in terms of the different families watermarks this is by far the most interesting one to me after you take a look at the three different artworks i have to say i actually like the borderless one the best there's just something about the big imposing guild uh, not guild sorry family symbol with these spheres of power floating up above it i don't know i just picture looking up at it although the view from the first one is also really really cool and seeing how high those windows are you know what i gotta say actually i think it might be a tie between those two because those giant windows the sense of scale used with the little individuals down there is really really enjoyable for me i dig this concept then we've got spara's headquarters this is the forest plains island one it says to most the nido sanctuary is an office complex to the brokers it's a vault of secrets. So this is essentially the headquarters of the individuals that we saw in the ascendancy card for the brokers, right? And this is absolutely beautiful. This one here on the left, the original, is gorgeous. You've got these 
big, beautiful, ornate windows, giant statues. You've got water running down in all these mini waterfalls. I love it. You'd have the soothing sound of them trickling all around you. It's got such a great vibe to it. The borderless version has the crazy little griffin faces all leaning in from the sides, looking real cool. Ultimately, the skyscraper version to me has, like, the big trees are kind of interesting, but it's not my favorite comparatively, right? So, I said we would talk about the five families. So, let's do that now. Let's get their watermark logos up on the screen. So, we've got Obscura, Maestros, Riveteers, Cabaretti, and the Brokers. The Obscura are the white, blue, black. Now, these are the wizard class. They have a lot of gifts with the arcane, and specifically, they're into magics that are deceptive, so they can try and control people through deception, right? The Maestros are the blue, black, red group. They are the assassins, but they're also vampires that are wealthy and are obsessed with luxury. So they're going to do essentially whatever it takes to maintain their luxurious lifestyle and they hide under the guise of high-end art brokers the riveteers are your i guess more almost common everyman organization in some ways it is the black red green group and they're about destruction whether it's demolishing buildings or people's bodies they are all about just wailing on everything and laying it to waste and actually their family is led by a dragon which makes sense i mean they're all about intimidating other organizations and people as well so that works after that, we've got the Cabaretti. Red, green, white. These are the party boys. They're druids. They're into using charisma magic, magic that can manipulate nature as well, and just give them the sort of enjoyable party life that they want. So when we saw them kind of lounging there, that is the vibe. I like these guys the most. The Brokers are obviously the group we've seen the most because we got to see them in the Ascendancy. They're the green, white, blue. Now, these are the lawyers of the world. But at the same time, they actually secretly follow a doomsday prophecy about New Capenna. They believe that at a certain point, everything is going to come to an end. It's not clear whether they work towards or against that or whether they're just trying to protect themselves so far from the story, but it's definitely of interest to me. Now, that wraps up all the new Capenna information I have. I do have information for another video with a bunch of special edition list cards, so I'm going to go and work on that right now. If you want to check it out, you can subscribe or just come back later and see if it's available because I'll put it out as soon as it is. But for now, thanks for coming by. Big shout out to all my patrons and I'm going to leave a link to the Urza playlist storyline from Fantasy Geographic. Best storyline in Magic the Gathering. Go check it out. Thanks for coming by. See you next time.